thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. And um, I'm just going to say I have a little bit of a cough, so if I start coughing, don't worry, I'll probably survive. Um, so thanks very much. So save as, memory and the archive in the age of digital technologies. The digital raises new issues about memory and knowledge, production and transmission in the so-called era of the archive. Technologies offer new futures for our pasts. And, present, um, and the past and the present are increasingly thought through in terms of future access and preservation. This temporal dislocation perfectly captures the moment in which we currently find ourselves in relation to digital technologies. The feeling of not being coterminous with our time, the belatedness and not there yet quality of the now. As my colleague Clay Shirky puts it, it's as if we were once again inhabiting the uncertainty of the early 1500s. Looking back at the uh, Gutenberg era now, it is easy to describe the world before the invention of the printing press in the early 1400s or after the spread of print culture in the late 1500s. But what about the long transition period when people knew where they'd been but had no idea where they were headed? That is where we all find ourselves now. Academics, artists, scientists, publishers, computer whizzes, designers, and economic forecasters alike. The anxiety, however, cannot be limited to technology, to whether this or that system or platform will predominate. Neither can we attribute it to the competing economic models brought into conflict by shifting con consumer habits or the struggles for control played out in many arenas from national interests to global markets. Rather, we know from that earlier shift from embodied oral cultures to print culture that what we know is radically altered by how we know it. While embodied cultures relied on the now of physical presence and relations being there together for transmission, print made it possible to separate knower from known and transmit knowledge through letters, books, and other documents over broad stretches of time and space. In an earlier work, I described these epistemic systems as a repertoire of embodied knowledge, the doing, repeating, and mimetic practices that are performances, gestures, orality, movement, dance, singing, in short, all those acts usually thought of as ephemeral, non-reproducible knowledge transferred from body to body, and the archive of supposedly lasting stable objects, such as books, documents, bones, photographs, and so on, that theoretically resist change over time. While the live nature of the repertoire confined to the ever-changing now has long lived under the sign of erasure, the archive constructed and safeguarded a knowable past that could be accessed over time. The different systems provoke different ways of knowing and being in the world. The repertoire supports embodied cognition, collective, collective thinking, and knowing in place, whereas archival culture favors rational, linear, and so-called objective and universal thought and individualism. The rise of memory and history as differentiated categories seems to stem from the embodied, documented divide. But these are not static binaries or a sequential pre-post, but active processes, two of several interrelated and conterminous systems that continually participate in the creation, storage, um, and transmission of knowledge. Digital technologies constitute yet another system of transmission that is rapidly complicating Western systems of knowledge, raising new issues around presence, temporality, space, embodiment, sociality, and memory, usually associated with the repertoire, and those of copyright, authority, history, and preservation linked to the archive. Digital databases seemingly combine the access to vast reservoirs of materials we normally associate with, ac with archives and the ephemerality of the live. A website crash reminds us of the fragility of this technology. Although the digital will not replace print culture any more than print replaced embodied practice, the ways in which it alters, expands, challenges, and otherwise affects our current ways of knowing and being have not completely come into focus. 
If the re repertoire consists of embodied acts of transfer and the archive preserves and safeguards print and material culture, objects, what to make of the digital that displaces both bodies and objects as it transmits f more information far faster and more broadly than ever before. Here I will argue that the digital that enables almost limitless access to information yet shifts constantly ushers in not the age of the archive, nor simply a new dimension of interaction for the repertoire, but something quite different that draws on and simultaneously alters both. Again, I want to insist that the embodied, the archival, and the digital overlap and work together and mutually construct each other. We have always lived in a mixed reality. The Aztecs performed elaborate ceremonies in attempts to mirror and control the powerful cosmic forces that govern their lives. Sue Ellen Case argues that the medieval cathedral staged the virtual, while the 17th century theater patented its ownership of virtual space. Clearly, the technologies of the virtual have changed more than the concept of living simultaneously in contiguous spaces. Losing oneself in a literary work of fiction or getting caught up in the as-ifness of a performance or entering a trance state in Candomblé have long preceded the experience of living an alternate reality provided by the virtual realm online. But the digital and the virtual are not interchangeable, even though they're often used as if they were. The change in technologies is profoundly significant. Since the late 19th century, for example, Kodak has socialized people into living with and using new technologies. This is a 1913 photograph. <clears throat> this camera was light enough for women to handle as they enjoyed the increasing independence, mobility, and leisure time of class privilege. The affluent could make memories now to use later. In order to sell memory as a commodity, Kodak also actively promoted nostalgia as an epistemic lens. The urgency of the photo rests on our knowing that the photographed object and subject will be lost, that the present vanishes, and that these happy moments are bound to end. The nostalgia is built into the technology itself, a memento mori, as were the first miniature paintings of loved ones. These early technologies stage the vanishing now to construct a past that can be accessed or mourned and possessed, as is as here in the caption, at some later time. The pace of the socialization into the digital has accelerated vertiginously. As paradigms and practices shift in the storing and transmission of knowledge, we are getting glimpses into the range of implications from the most practical, how and where do we store our materials if we want to preserve them, to the most existential, does the epistemic change radically alter our subjectivity? Are the changes qualitative or quantitative? Does the current shift re resemble past ones, say the transition from an oral culture to print? Or does the move towards digital technologies enact its own specific social and ethical presuppositions? While the digital reconfigures both the live and the archival, I will start with the latter. The new digital era is obsessed with, ar with archives as metaphor, as place, as symptom, and as a logic of knowledge production, transmission, and preservation. So why? The term archive has become increasingly capacious, interchangeable with save, contain, record, upload, preserve, and share, and with systems of organization such as collection, library, inventory, catalog, and museum. Archive seems to magically transcend the contradictions between open and closed, democratic and elitist. A fetish, it covers over several contradictory and irreconcilable mechanisms of power. But without understanding the power and control that underwrite the archive, it's difficult to assess the political and economic implications of what is saved and what is forgotten. Since the archon served as a place where official documents were filed and stored in ancient Greece, the archive has been synonymous with government and power. Before discussing what I feel is at stake in these changing definitions and distinctions, I will clarify how I understand archive. An archive is simultaneously an authorized place, 
the physical or digital site housing collections, a thing or object, a collection of things, the historical records and unique or representative objects marked for inclusion, and a practice, the logic of selection, organization, access, and preservation over time that deems certain objects archivable. Place, thing, practice function in a mutually sustaining way. The thing is nameable, storable, and preservable, imbued with the power and authority, perhaps even aura, of both place and selection. We know the thing is important because it has been selected to be preserved in the archive. It does not matter whether the thing was made to be saved. Carbon copies of letters and even daily newspapers or handouts of a protest march take on a special status in the archive. In turn, notions of historical accuracy, of authenticity, authorship, property, including copyright, specialized knowledge, expertise, cultural, relative, uh, cultural relevance, and even truth are underwritten by faith in the object found in the archive. The circular legitimating epistemic system again affirms the centrality of the place. The archive comes to function, Foucault noted, not simply as the space of enunciation, but the place from which one speaks but also, and primarily, the law of what can be said. Place, thing, practice exist in a tightly bound connection in which each relies on the other for its authority. Each has a different logic and politics of making visible. <clears throat> but why has archive gained such enormous power, or better, become the site of such contestations of power as we move into the digital age? On one hand, digital technologies offer the updated Marxist promise for the 21st century. That is that we, individual users, now control the means of production, distribution, and access to information, communities, and online worlds. While the capitalist grids and surveillance systems sustaining the digital remain, if anything, stronger than ever, the egalitarian and even revolutionary promise is compelling. In 2006, Time Magazine declared you person of the year because you control the information age. YouTube invites us to broadcast ourselves. Facebook allows us to share our daily lives with our community of friends. Twitter provides real-time updates on where we are and what we're doing. Second Life offers us a chance to design our own avatars and explore, shop, meet, and live online in ways that perhaps can't happen in First Life. Philip Rosedale, its founder, envisions life as a project rather than an existential condition, a metaverse, he calls it, as opposed to a universe. There is no doubt about the potentially democratizing power of internet technologies, particularly, as opposed to television, that seem to offer as many points of entry and navigation as there are users. The role of Facebook in organizing rallies in Turkey, texting by protesters demonstrating against the G20, and Twittering in Iran recently indicate a level of inclusivity and immediacy in the digital that would be unthinkable in archival practice. I take the contradictory, complicated, multivalent aspects of digital technologies as a given, a necessary starting place. <clears throat> what I am questioning, however, is whether digital technologies merely extend what we do in embodied and print or material cultures, the repertoire and the archive, into cyberspace, or whether they constitute their very own system of transmission that share some of the features we are used to while moving us into a very different system of knowledge and subjectivity. What is at stake in this argument? In archive and repertoire, I asked what was gained or lost by extending archive to include the live. Embodied practices measured by the knowledge regime sustained by the archive, I argued, fail to provide hard evidence of the past. The impossibility of archiving the live came to equate absence and disappearance. Historical documents prove that the land belonged to the settlers, not to the native populations, etc. The personal and political repercuss repercussions have been devastating. Here I pose a similar question. 
what is gained or lost by using the word archive to describe the seemingly democratic, participatory, non-specialized, readily available, uploading, publication, and access to materials in cyberspace. Some digital archives function much in the way brick and mortar archives do. The Hemispheric Institute's uh, digital video library, HIDVL, that I helped create is an online archive. HIDVL is a growing online repository of some 600 hours of non-downloadable streaming videos of performance from throughout the Americas that is free and accessible for viewing. HIDVL started in the early days of online video archiving in 2000 as a special collection of NYU's libraries and will, be, and will be maintained for a very long time. Each video or each hour video costs more than $1,000 to process, not counting the intellectual labor that has gone into curating the materials, developing a trilingual interface, creating artist profiles, indices, search tools, and so on. Different technologies spur different practices and vice versa and different things to collect. Digital technologies far exceed print in offering scholars and artists a way to both document and consult live practices. Video captures a sense of the kinetic and oral dimensions of the event or the work, the physical and facial expressions of participants, the choreographies of meaning. We knew the wonderful performance work in the Americas had either not been documented, or if it had, videos were rapidly decomposing in boxes under the artist's beds and in their closets. Digitizing them would not only preserve them, but would also make them widely and easily accessible, a major issue in Latin America where universities have limited holdings and publications have very limited circulation. We were also eager to explore the theoretical complexities of archiving performance and the complicated relationships between, the live, between live performance and its many mediations. On one level, then, we were simply transferring video <clears throat> from one digital format to another. On another, we were commissioning and recording performances that we then transferred to HIDVL. So while we were adding to the collection, we also helped generate new work. Some performances staged the archive, revivals based in part on old scripts and videos. Other performances, such as the work of Anna Devere Smith, are better known as video than as live solo work. Some performances become themselves only through the process of documentation, say Anna Mendieta's work, which was staged for the camera and known only through photographs or video. We have born digital materials that never had an original in another medium. This is the work of Fulana. If you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. It's fantastic. Um, these materials give rise to a new scholarly thinking about the many lives of performance, past and present, and allow us access to work and traditions that we cannot see live, and encourage us to reflect on what happens in live events that rely so heavily on context and audience when shown to people from very different contexts. I would love to speculate what viewers in 500 years will make of Reverend Billy and the Church of Stop Shopping. This is Reverend Billy, but this is not the time. The politics of the copy, rather than the original, helps us imagine HIDVL as a post-colonial archive. We return the materials and the digital copy to the creators who maintain the rights. We capture or copy the original signal of the videos and store them in Iron Mountain, the archive of archives, the new digital authority. I am not kidding. This is where the videos live. They are in a mountain. Um, this is the control center. Um, it's the same place where the US government keeps many of its records, where Disney keeps all its original tapes. So we're in very good company. So if the world comes to an end, at least part of it will be available um, to be viewed by who knows whom um, in that age. Anyway, so, um, so anyway, all these, uh, the original signal is kept and updated and copied into new formats as the technologies change. But copy as a form of transmission also differentiates the archival from the digital, and most profoundly from the repertoire. People may copy the way that others dance or speak, but we usually call this mimesis or imitation, a form of learning through doing or parodying another's actions. Each iteration differs from the next. Living creatures engage in recognizable behaviors that are not performed the same way twice. 
even with strenuous discipline, embodied practices will always show a slight degree of variation. A printed copy of a book, however, is virtually indistinguishable from others of the same run. The only differences stem from use, the underlined word, or a torn jacket. Nonetheless, the number of books in a run is finite. If I give away my last copy, it is gone. The function control C allows me to copy automatically without a discernible limit. Unlike the archive based on the logic and aura of the original or representative item, the digital relies on the logic and mechanism of the copy that enables the migration from one system or format to another that secures preservation. Save as. Interestingly, the aura that comes from the selection process can accrue to the digital copies archived in collections. Aura may have as much to do with the nature of the selection process as it does with the status of the thing. In other ways, however, HIDVL replicates the hierarchies and exclusions inherent in the archival project itself. The process of selection and valorization by experts maintains the logic of the archive intact. Dreams of unlimited access seduce users to participate in the colonialist fantasy that total access is not simply an ideal, but a right. While performance scholarship worries about context, audience, and reception more than about the original or authentic, which is impossible insofar as performance is never the same way twice, the human effort that goes into this project, the emphasis on training and expertise, the institutional auspices provided by the university, and the required levels of financial support makes us facetiously compare ourselves to medieval monks. Nonetheless, most of what people call online archives are not archives, though they may have some archival features. Skits posted on YouTube or other sites are not archived, even though YouTube has been referred to as the media archive. This is actually not a technological issue or even a preservation issue because storage is cheap. It's a commitment issue. The owners may or may not commit to preserving materials long term. Further, there is no selection process for materials uploaded online. No one vouches as to its sources or veracity. Expertise is irrelevant. The materials seem free and available to anyone with internet access, avoiding the rituals of participation governing traditional archives. Power and politics continue to underwrite access, though at first it's not clear how. These so-called digital archives can be characterized as by, as what N. Catherine Hales calls a skeuomorph, a design function that is no longer functional in itself, but that refers back to a feature that was functional at an earlier time. So the trash can icon on our computers that makes a swishing noise is a skeuomorph. <coughs> Sorry. So are digital documents and stickies, all reference past functions to help users adapt to new ways of organizing information. Uh, let's see if I make it. <clears throat> it's a familiarity with these past things and practices that facilitate the leap into a virtual place via technologies most people cannot really comprehend or control. The things and practices, of course, are not the same either. Online items are composed of bits, not atoms. Digital technology demands that everything or practice be transformed into an object and tagged. Our relationship with the thing also changes. We can link to an image, but we cannot hold, touch, taste, or smell a person or object. Memory, um, memory of distant, Uh, memory, so I, there's something wrong with this thing here, but um, just my point was that um, memory of, um, so the memory is distant and locatable in, uh, the, in print culture, but the here and now of the web is immediate and only apparently unlocatable. 
as we're going to see. Some of the new digital variations severely challenge the dominance and logic of the archive. Many of the very large projects, like Google Books, are commercial, though they claim to provide free access of incomplete versions of texts, thus assuring neither access nor preservation, though the order icon is ready at hand. Google claims sole ownership of orphan books, an end run around laws pertaining to content, authorship, and copyright. If print culture produced the copyright, it's not clear yet what the legal and legitimating mechanisms will control issues of access and transmission online. As important as the pressure of, on the thing or content, perhaps, is the invisible politics of place. Where do these collections and archives live? You know where ours is, right? Uh, Google et al. own the operating systems and databases that enable access to their massive repositories. This poses other legal issues not covered in conventional copyright agreements. By owning the operating systems, these commercial giants, in fact, become the ultimate guarantors of value and control. They can censor materials, cherry pick titles, and rescind licensing privileges for us who now lease rather than own copies of books. These digital practices loop back into print culture as well. The most obvious re repercussion, who wants to pay for a book they can access free online? I am not against freely sharing materials. Latin American scholars and students survive on pirated books and articles. Nonetheless, it's important to note that what's online is not free. Nonetheless, um, the economic models have long-term repercussions across a range of archival practices having to do with understandings of content, ownership, authority, peer review, copyright, and so on. Preservation of digital materials, thus, is not the happy byproduct of digitizing or uploading. While it may be true that data never die, it is also true that they live as bits of information that we might not be able to access. Changing technologies and platforms render our materials obsolete far more often than they archive or preserve them. Finally, I would like to take a quick look at the complicated and changing ways embodied print and digital cultures affect the what we know and how we know it by going back to Time Magazine's 2006 issue, Person of the Year. Here is an image of my copy. Um, Time, Person of the Year, a computer with a thin red line reminiscent of YouTube, cuts across the monitor running towards 002006. Its screen is a reflective, shiny, silver mylar mirror. You on the bottom left-hand side, yes, you, you control the information age. Welcome to your world. Nicely balanced on the cover to the right of you is, well, me, sort of. The mailing sticker has my name misspelled and address on it. The cover proclaims the imperative to perform. You insert yourself. Yes, you, your face on the cover. There's a twist here, too. While the magazine requires an embodied response from me, I need to hold it in my hands and up to my face to see myself, the design conceit of the video monitor with the timeline transports me to the digital. I try to align the discursive you with the embodied me. I hold the magazine close. Even so, I hardly recognize myself. This distorting mirror shows you me as not me, only the vaguest image, a concept more than a person. And who is the invisible I that names me you? Is it Uncle Sam's pointing finger from the World War II posters? Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market? Althusser's hailing you? The unseen I of surveillance that demands if you see something, say something? or a combination, a parody of hailing and recognition. Martin Burbur's I, thou, minus the I. Inside the cover, an ad for Chevrolet announces, this is our person of the year. And the truck of the year that dominates the environment. The contest and contestation of who really controls the world and its resources start before I even get to the table of contents. And here is the issue in Time's online archive. The bull black you dominates the screen. Yes, you is centered under the screen rather than to the left. Who needs a mailing label online? The delivery system is quite different. The reflective surface is gone. 
Times managing editor acknowledges the challenges in reproducing the effect of the mirror when, quote, there's no one standing in front of it. So Time created an animated online version using photos apparently submitted by readers that appeared in the print version to keep something of the interactive quality of the original. This clearly is a very different kind of performance, where you, I, is positioned as a spectator to other people's photographs rather than a subject or protagonist. The online you becomes the object of my looking, one more commodity. It doesn't take much to see that these photos could not have been generated by readers. They are all posed in identical candy-colored boxes. Again, a photo simulated to look like YouTube. You comes in all colors. With one odd exception, you is young, beautiful, under 30, happy, self-satisfied, cool, independent, on the go, not doing much of anything except listening to music or performing for the viewer. I didn't put them all up here, but you get a, you get a sense. Only two of the men seem to have traditional professions, the doctor who is scratching his head in bewilderment um, and the soldier. The new you is a global citizen. Mobile ethnicities transcend geographical divides. Race and gender are now a style or fashion statement. We're all post-racism, post-sexism, the image suggests. Space, of course, is produced. This is a studio backdrop. You is unlocatable in other ways as well. There are no hints as to where people are or where they come from, no other people in the shots, no family photos. Two women photograph themselves, very you. The celebratory images affirm embodiment. The designer body seemingly provides an entry point to the world, but these are not the bodies of the repertoire. This you actually exists not in relation to, but as separate from. There is no outside, no exterior with which you might maintain a relationship. The interpenetration of self exterior that Merleau-Ponty wrote of, intersubjectivity is possible only through technology. You might chat and text, but not talk or read. This you is a product rather than the producer of the information age. There is much more to say about the construction of you, both as person of the year and in these images, which cannot be included here, but it is important to note that the online you is an elusive object. When I tried to access the virtual gallery a year later, it was gone. The links took me to Vladimir Putin. <laughs> when I looked again, after six months, some of the images from the gallery were online, but as loose images, not as part of the magazine's layout or organizing concept. However, other images not included in the original publication had also been added as if they were part of the original, while others had been reinscribed with logos of other websites. What kind of archive is this that erases rather than preserves the traces of its former incarnation? The Time Archive then does not maintain the objects or even digital renditions. My experience with the issue is different. I cannot hold it, I cannot flip pages, there are no page numbers online, reading has morphed into navigation or surfing. Instead of linear and sequential cause and effect, the digital is about simultaneity, interruption, and multitasking. Everything written for online media tends to be short. The digital has its own attention span. I engage in politics online even as I do something else. The essays extracted from the issues are searchable and clearly attributed to authors and identifiable with URLs. But I cannot get a sense of connections between various social, economic, and political relations by examining the layouts and the physical placement of essays and ads. <clears throat> Where is the happy cowboy, the real person of the year, according to Chevrolet? I cannot go back and examine the magazine issue as a flimsily bound microcosm of cultural concerns, fears, and strategies made visible in the competing messages. Instead of an editor in charge of putting the materials together, the online curatorial process is driven by data mining techniques and crawlers to identify patterns of information in a database. I too am being constantly updated by today's ads, all programmed to pick up keywords and customize the display to suit my tastes. This too is all about me or you, but in a different way. 
It is my profile, not the editor's, that arranges the information for me. The web's interactivity filters my information and sends it to those who would pay for access to me. As Wendy Chun notes, online, in order to use, one has to agree to be used. The digital archival practice, I believe, can prove profoundly anti-archival. The shift from the archive to the digital has moved us away from the institutional, the confined, the long-term of Foucault's disciplinary society to the controlled society outlined by Deleuze, free-floating, short-term, rapidly changing. We move from the analog to the digital, from signature to password, from citizen to nomad, from typographic man to graphic man, as McLuhan put it. History now is something we can, that can be packaged and owned, as you see down here. One more possession to enjoy is in the Kodak ad. For better and for worse, the politics of the archive are not the politics of the digital. What counts as embodied knowledge has also morphed. Cyberspace has forced us to name and delimit the real. Real time is not the same as the present. Live is not the same as alive. Online community is not the same as a group of people. The flesh body is not the same as the very powerful electronic body, the one whose credit ratings or medical history or suspicious activities can sync an application or have a person strip searched at the border. The digital has also provoked an upset in terms of expertise. Many major scholars feel totally incompetent with ever-changing technologies. The young are the true masters of this field, but even the young no less than the younger. It's not just the ever-accelerating generational shifts that make people feel that they are out of the meaning-making loop. The subject as consumer is tied into the rapid cycle of obsolescence necessary to sell. Forgetting, as Paul Connerton notes, is an essential ingredient in the operation of the market. The feeling of not being coterminous with our time, then, is built into the technologies themselves. The anxiety about loss and forgetting, I believe, might explain our current obsession with archives and the nostalgia both for embodiment and for the object. Technologies code the affect in the constant mandate to save and save as, and we experience a symptom, the need to preserve not just things, documents, bones, fossils, but ways of thinking and knowing, sociability, affect, emotions, gesture, memories, and also processes, the ways in which we work, select, transmit, access, and preserve. But the digital, I suggested, will not replace archives or repertoires. If anything, earlier distinctions between online and offline have crumbled for the many of us across the social spectrum who are now never offline, either because we have cell phones or because our money is kept in bank accounts. The simultaneity of these systems of transmission makes us think about them in new ways. Archival practice, once a devastating tool of empire, now seems the guarantor of authentic and enduring. Digital technologies have only heightened the appreciation of embodiment. Perhaps the current rush to archive has less to do with place-thing practice and more with trying to save and preserve a sense of self as we face the uncertain future, emphasizing our agency in the selection and meaning-making process that we fear threatens to outpace us. Thank you. Thank you very much. It seems to me that this um, occasion, this event itself, is in some ways proof of one prong of your thesis, uh, that of the overlapping of the embodied, the archival and the digital in the sense that you're here with us and we with you in an embodied form. You draw on an archive. This is being recorded uh, for an archive that will nonetheless live in digital space. That's right. And we'll see what after that. That's right. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we have time for questions. Uh, Diana has agreed to take some questions. And so I would ask if you do uh, want to ask a question to come forward to the microphone here and there so that we can get your questions as well as the responses uh, as part of the audio recording. So, and Diana will field the questions herself. Okay. Hi, um, I was, you mentioned the um, colonizing power of the internet um, and sort of the voyeuristic element of that. And I was wondering if you could speak just a little bit more of the colonizing versus subversive 
power of the internet and digital technology. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't say colonizing power of the internet, but I think it's true. It's also colonizing power. Now, I was talking about the archives as, as tools and empire, but um, I think it's true. Oops, sorry. Um, I think it's true that the that the internet does have a huge colonizing power. Um, one of the things, for example, that was really clear to, to me when we were doing the hemispheric, because it's trilingual, is that everything um, is meant to be in English, right? So actually getting the internet to do things in Spanish or Portuguese or other languages is very difficult. Um, even in the, in the meta tagging and the labeling of things, right? So in all the back end things, it's very, very difficult. So there's that, right? And it introduces a whole way of other thinking and so forth. But I think the subversive level is, is very powerful as well. And especially this immediacy, the, the immediate power to respond, um, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's an incredible tool, and I could not personally live without the internet, not one day. But um, I think just my, my point is basically that the internet is so controlled that we're not always aware of how it's controlled, right? And we don't know when we're using it who owns the internet and how they get to get you offline if they want to, if they want to target you. They can cut you out, right? Uh, they can make it impossible for you to go online, or they can trace everything that you do online. So. That's just a trade-off, right? So while um, it's, it's easy, I guess, or easier to see that kind of thing taking on an embodied practice, right? They stop you at borders. You have to show your ID. You know, there's many, many ways in which we're constantly being asked to identify ourselves. Um, the internet seems such a free space that I think that we feel that putting in our password and like that uh, saves our privacy or secures our privacy, when in fact, I think the myth of privacy online is just um, it's a myth. So uh, I was just trying to point out that as well. Thank you so much for your talk, a very suggestive in many ways. So my question would be, I would like to know, how do you think that all these memories of things that human beings we've been constructing for so many centuries uh, can be preserved if they cannot be digitalized because everything cannot be under the digital substance. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I guess I would say that there's a lot of things that have been preserved for generations and generations that have never been digitized, right? Like practice. So, you know, there's, I was talking um, to a group of students from theater, dance, and performance studies this morning about a uh, dance that's been uh, performed in the Americas as far as we know. Um, from the 16th century, but there's evidence that it goes back way before then, and it's still being performed, right? That never passed through digital, and it didn't pass through print culture either, right? These were things that were just passed on from one generation to another, and I think that we can see many, many instances of that. Um, and so in this earlier work, <clears throat> my point was basically that we hadn't learned how to think about those practices and authorize them. Well, authorize is the wrong word, right? Because that's from author. So the reason that we haven't legitimated them is because they were unauthorized. So how do we think about transmission in that way and the things that have endured and will continue to endure? Um, so for example, someone said, in fact, Catherine Hales, who I admire enormously, but she's done a huge amount of work on the digital and um, is, is doing um, a collection of works that have been written, liter literary pieces have been written for the archive. But she says these works are going to be um, obsolete because we can't maintain these formats that we're creating. So a lot of the stuff that we're archiving now is not going to be there. So she says, this new period is going to be like a new dark ages. <clears throat> now, she meant that in a kind of a negative way, right? Like we assume the dark ages are pretty dark. But I'm thinking, well, what about all the embodied practice stuff? I mean, what about all the stuff that people have always been doing, right? So if we think more about embodiedness, we see how important it is alongside print and how important that is. And some of the stuff in the digital, I think is much more about the now. It's much more about sociability and connecting and talking to your friend on Skype who lives someplace else and like that than it is about archiving. So I think that as far as archiving goes, it's not going to have the stability that we are thinking it has. So just one more example. Um, I have a friend who's putting all her kind of memory eggs in the digital basket. 
And um, so she had a birthday, and I made a photo album, a traditional photo album with photographs. And I said, keep this, because you're not going to be able to see your other one, right? Because we always have this argument, right? She thinks it's going to last. I said, it's not going to last. If you, if you think about, um, say, a disk that you had five years ago, your computer can't read that disk anymore, right? So you have to go to a special place to get that read. Right? Um, there are systems already, there's document systems on my Mac that don't read my earlier Mac document systems. Right? So it's this way in which everything that we're producing is unreadable by the same system that produced it. So it's, a, it's a, just a very, very serious problem. But I think it's much more about, the, so my next piece that I'm writing now is about the digital and the repertoire, which I think is really where the interesting part of the digital, for me at least, um, lies. Thank you for your talk. It's really illuminating. And I thought that um, I wanted to just add a PS to what you were saying and also find out your thoughts about it. I work on a National Archives project, the Emma Goldman Papers, and they insist that your rec all the documents be put on microfilm. And they're in Iron Mountain. Oh, right. And they're available all around the world. And yet, everybody's throwing out their microfilm I readers. Know. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. So do you think that that's something that would actually last? Or is, the, or is it the National Archives is way behind? <laughs> I, I don't know. I think, um, I think that you, what I would say is, I mean, if we're just talking about archival, that what we want is a lot of duplication or, or um, replication or redundancy, I guess would be the word, right? I would keep the text. I would keep the microfiche or film. I would keep the digital. I would update the digital, and we just hope, right? But it's very interesting what gets lost in those transmissions from one technology to another. It's really, really interesting because, say, for example, if you have a whole collection, <clears throat> I don't know anything about this, but somebody was telling me um, about what happened when you had um, the canisters, the wax canisters that had the music. Yes, and exactly. So when they went from that to the, to the record, I guess, <coughs> about 80% of it <coughs> had to be thrown out, did not make that leap. So imagine all those materials that we think somehow were preserved. They're just not available, right? And of course, it's all the women's work that gets not transferred. I mean, then we know what the politics and the selection elements are, right? I mean, that sort of is always the same. But the fact that every single time that we do something like that, we lose and we miss a lot of material. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, I guess I wanted to take up two things that you said, one right now and one earlier. Um, one from the talk at the end when you said trying to, to develop and preserve a sense of self through the digital. I thought it was really beautiful. And then also your, your late comment about um, Skype and various social networking things as being simply about communication um, as opposed to about not embodied practices. Um, and I was thinking with, uh, for example, the Facebook movie is coming out tomorrow. This film, Catfish, I don't know if you've seen it yet or read about it. Um, it was a huge hit at Sundance, which is about three filmmakers who develop a relationship with a family on Facebook with a full set of network of people, and they go out to meet this person. And it's a mystery. It's like a thriller. Because again, the sense of self that's being that's being archived <coughs> is not always the actual self itself, right? right? Um, so then, what winds up happening there is it looks that the, the social networking stuff is its own form. What happens if we look at that stuff as a form of embodied practice? What does that do to the larger ideas of the digital that you were talking about before? Right. Well, I think maybe I didn't express myself very well because. I'm, I'm really thinking that the really interesting part of the digital is as sociability, and that new kinds of relationships are getting developed there. So it's not the same as embodied. Okay. It's a different thing. Um, and if somebody says, you know, who has like 800 friends like my daughter has on Facebook? I mean, 
nobody has 800 friends. I mean, even on Facebook, I only have like 100, so friend me. Uh, <laughs> now that we're in the race for friends. Um, but, but it's interesting that those kinds of relationships, like what I'm saying, the Skype, for example, or those kinds of relationships, are really asking us then to redefine what we think of as by, like presence. Mm -hmm. Are we present together? It is, and I think that that's, that's what I'm saying, that I think that the long-term repercussions of this are really about subjectivity. Yeah. I mean, I think it's that profound. I don't think it's simply about where we're gonna keep our stuff. Yeah. I think it's really about how we understand the relationship between first and second life, or is this all first life, or is this, you know, um, those relationships are very real relationships and some people live. And the other thing that I think is really important to, to think about is, for example, there are parts of the world where very few people have access to internet. <coughs> but I don't think that that means that they don't live in a world that's primarily about, or, or primarily in one way, <coughs> about the digital, right? Because there, there are materials on them, even if they don't have access to them, which can be pretty scary. <coughs> Excuse me. Could somebody ask another question while I trip <laughs> Um, thank you for a, a really beautiful presentation, and um, I think my um, my reaction to hearing you speak, and also that question then, um, triggered something in terms of the way in which, just in your presentation today, the sort of repertoire and the archive, or the digital, were not so much in opposition, but sort of separate. And I was thinking, well, how is the um, the rep how is the digital affecting the repertoire, like? So the other way, if you like, in terms of, and, and an, I had an anxiety that was about, well, okay, the repertoire may continue and certainly it continues to be taught through oral and, um, and bodily tradition, but performance tradition, but um, equally it would seem that the digital must be surely impacting on the repertoire and that sort of gave rise to a concern as to whether we're so sort of aware, our, our awareness of each other's communication outside of the digital realm is being finessed as it, as it perhaps has been in the past? Or how is it being affected by this technology? Well, I'll give you one good example. I think it's a wonderful example, at least. At NYU, um, the freshman class, or the first year class, a lot of the students had met each other online before they got together, you know, they met their roommates and like this. But they were very shy about greeting each other face to face. So the university had to have a meet and greet where they taught them how to get together and say hello to each other in real life because they had developed a relationship online that had nothing to do with, with the uh, embodied experience. So, I mean, that's pretty strange, right? I mean, it's a different kind of sociability that's, that's happening. But I guess I would just also say that I think about embodied practice very broadly. So like, for example, these are forums that get repeated and that will likely be repeated unless you're completely replaced by an online university. Right? I mean, there's many ways in which knowledge production happens through embodied practice. And it could be you know, cooking with somebody or it can be you know, singing or it can be whatever, right? So there's a lot of things that are part of our daily lives that I'm confident will continue to exist, right? So it's not just the formal thing about the dance or the ritual or the theater piece. I think my question might relate a bit to what you were just asking, and it has to do with the notion of the copy in the digital realm, right? And it just seems that, um, you know, this question of the repertoire as sort of having an inherent a quality of difference in repetition, that it seemed as if you're saying that in the, digi in the digital realm that doesn't quite work the same way, right? The time when you mentioned the copy and the notion of saving, you suggested that there was a sort of inf infinite way in which things can be copied or saved in the digital. But I wondered because the way that I think of that function, save as, that's in your title, um, 
is about difference, right? So save, save as versus, versus save for me is that when you, when you just press save, you're just sort of infinitely reproducing what's already there. But when you press save as, you can make a difference to the document and have two separate right. copies that's, that have slightly different things. It might just be that you know, the, the tagline of the second file has my name in it rather than you know, just the name of the document. Right. But it seemed to me that the title of your talk suggested that in the digital there's a sort of quality of potential difference uh, in repetition. And I wondered if that might have something to do with the question of the digital and the repertoire. Well, that's really interesting. Um, because when, when you're migrating materials online, you always have to save as, right? You're saving it into a different format. But the saving is almost always a loss. Right, because things get lost in every single time that you copy from one format to another. So I meant it more, I guess, in, um, in terms of, but you're right, there seems to be like a, an inherent, <coughs> so should I just call it save? I'm not sure because I don't, think, I don't think of save as just the one after the other, after the other, after the other. I'm thinking about it in terms of migration from format to format, <coughs> which still strikes me really different as a book of print culture or <clears throat> the way we might dance or, or learn a language from somebody or you know, learn through that kind of a process. I have to think about that some more or change my title. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this actually is bouncing off of that save and save as because I had a question that I couldn't articulate and that helped me do it. So uh, I'm involved with an archive that happens to be housed at NYU, an archive of historical materials that up until the digital age, they were responsible for saving, preserving, if you will. Right. Now they're beginning to digitize it. So digitization is thought of as a way of preserving. Right. And I'm just sort of curious with, I mean, now so much is being done to digitize physical archives, photographs of objects are now being digitized so they're accessible online. How do we understand that as preservation versus, you know, there's what is being, obviously something's being, something's being lost, but also an archive is not permanent. An archive deteriorates. An archive, you know, eventually the papers wear out or the objects become less usable. Right. It, it, does preserve relate in any way figure into this idea of save and save as? And, and what do you think about this digitization of archives as a project in general? I think it's very important. I think it's incredible. All I'm saying is that there are online archives, right? And they're like the NYU ones. I'm sure you have them here. They're special collections. And those are made to be preserved over time because the commitment in those is that they're going to upgrade and migrate the materials into different technologies, right? So it doesn't matter that my computer can't read an image, but the systems that they have in place will be able to read them mm -hmm. and will upgrade them to the next format and to the next format. And, you know, theoretically they capture the original signal. I have no idea what that means, but I take it from them that that's going to ensure the quality so that there's not this loss every single time. Um, <clears throat> that we're making a, another copy of it, right? That's the idea. So yes, it's somebody's business to do that. It takes huge amount of resources and it takes a library or, you know, universities are really, really important in this way because if universities don't do it, who's gonna do it? Google's certainly not gonna preserve uh, a lot of the stuff that we're interested in preserving. So I think that there it becomes the project for universities. That doesn't mean to me that it replaces the physical and you sure don't throw out the, the microfilm, you know, it becomes more and more way and the fact that it's accessible, you know, generally, I think it's fantastic because most people can't go. I mean, there's that whole elitist thing, right, about the archive as being somehow closed. You have to have permission to visit it. You have to be able to get there physically. I mean, what you can do when you put it online is incredible. What I was, I guess, contesting is this idea that New York Times has an archive of its pieces. If you've ever tried to use it, you know that that does not exist. It's not an archive. Um, Time Magazine, all of these things that theoretically have archives, they don't have archives. And so the things that we think are getting archived, I mean, a lot of people think that the stuff that they put on YouTube is going to be there forever. It's not going to be there forever. It's going to be there until they get tired of doing that and they'll do something else. And so I think it's just a consciousness of how we preserve certain materials 
And what the digital actually does, which I think is much more along the lines of those sociabilities and new ways of interacting that do have long-term implications in terms of, you know, how we think about, you know, life as an extension, as a this life or that life or live or alive or however we think of all of those contexts. I think in that sense, it's much more, it's going to have much uh, longer repercussions on us than just the ability to do this extraordinary stuff, which is to archive materials, right? Yeah, I guess the, the just final comment, the two things that concern me are that the <clears throat> access to the actual object is becoming less important. And there is something to be learned from access to the actual object, mm -hmm. to the turning of the page, mm -hmm. to the seeing the, the artifact. Mm -hmm. And secondly, and this is an issue that is, in fact, in case of this archive, that financially, the monies available, this is a material issue, are either going towards the digitization or towards the preservation of those objects. And in some way, those are being equated by the librarians, whereas the objects are becoming less and less available because now they say, well, they're online. We don't mm -hmm. need to preserve the object in the, to the extent, or we don't have the money to preserve that object to the extent that we used to anymore. Mm -hmm. So there is kind of a, it just seems to me some sort of a trade-off happening, accessibility versus mm -hmm. preservation, perhaps. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I would put it that bleakly on that side. Because I think libraries are still preserving their objects. I mean, NYU is certainly preserving the objects, even as it's trying to get stuff online for access. I don't think that that's exactly the, the trade-off. I think Kathy, Catherine. So I just wanted to um, hear how this fits into, you mentioned the next piece uh, of right. this. So what's, what's the bigger thing? Is it a book? Is yeah, it no, I got a new book online? coming out. No, 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 it's a, it's a new book, I, you know. I'm full of contradictions, right? I mean, <laughs> no, I mean. But, and can you give us a sense of what that bigger project looks like? No. No. <laughs> I'll, I'll be ready very soon. I'll be ready very soon. I can't, you know why, Catherine? Because I don't have a title. And until I don't have a title, I can't, I can't name it. So I was thinking about it this afternoon. I mean, I think about it all the time. I'm searching. I'm racking my brain. So when it comes up with a title, then I'll know. So um, is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> First, I didn't think it was working. Um, thank you. Like everyone else, I really enjoyed your talk. I, you. um, I, uh, what, one of the things that I really appreciated about the talk is that, um, that it gave more evidence for a way that I think many of us try to teach you teach your work, um, but a concern that I sometimes have is that reductive readings of your work ha uh, sometimes associate the archive with domination and the repertoire with subversion. Right. Right. And what I really appreciated about this talk was via the discussion of the digital that that was all mixed up there and that there, was, there were moments there where you were talking about the lack of archival um, intervention as as something that is potentially missing from some s situations that call themselves archives, mm -hmm. as well as that sort of sense that sometimes in the use of um, digital interaction or social media, we might feel ourselves to be in the midst of social agency of some sort, untrackable in the mode of transmitted behavior when in fact we very much are. <laughs> in the, you know. So I just wondered if you could sort of talk a bit more about about the the mixing up of subversion and domination in these modes and that right. it just seemed to me that no domain has a purchase on one Absolutely. or the other. Absolutely. No, and in fact in my archive book I say <clears throat> that ex you know very explicitly I said for example we have repertoires of, um, you know, I was thinking because of my work in Argentina, right, of these military parades, they were very clearly parodying, I mean, consciously the Nazi kind of rallies, right? And then you have the skinheads that, you know, so these uh, repertoires are very alive and very, very terrifying. So it's absolutely not that at all, not that at all. I just rather not write about the Nazis and the skinheads and, so it may seem more like, you know, it's always <laughs> writing about, you know, the liberating power of it. But absolutely, I think that on the contrary, you know, there's so many um, regimes, if you want, of, 
of embodied practice in so many ways in which that's uh, very controlled and very um, inhibiting and like that, that that's a real, that's a, not a reductive reading. I think that's a real misreading mm -hmm. of what I write. Well, I have a, a quick question, hopefully. Um, I know you said the next steps would be to look at, you're more interested in the digital and the repertoire. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in the digital and the archive. Okay. So what do you make of the whole Twitter, um, the, twi the tweets that might be archived at the Library of Congress? How does that fit into how we should think about these two worlds coming together? Yeah, no, I think they, you know, if Library of Congress decides to archive them, then that's fine. I think that, like I said before, right, even things that were not meant to be archived are often archived. We have newspapers, we have pamphlets, we have all sorts of things that theoretically are ephemeral or made to be for one occasion that are archived. That's a fantastic collection and I think that's great. But what I'm interested in the tweets is much more the sociability where people are following each other's jokes and they follow each other and they read, you know, certain kinds of tweets and, you know, it's like, Oh, well, what did so-and-so say today, even if it's somebody you don't know? You're just following them on these tweets. So that kind of sociability is really interesting, right? What those connections are and how that becomes almost like people you know that you follow in a kind of a very different way than you would talk to a friend or you would, I mean, maybe it's like reading a columnist or something, but it's like this immediate thing all the time. So, and, and the brevity of it, right? So. You know, I think, and as you said, I mean, all of these things work across the media, all the different forms. It's just what happens. I don't think that the logic of one is the logic of the other. And I think that's why differentiating them and the politics are not the same. So I think separating them out is kind of important if we're going to take embodied practice seriously, right? Because who can compare with the archive, right? In terms of durability, authority, all of that. But the digital is really interesting too and what that's going to do to to change all sorts of different kinds of relationships that we've established and that we've grown comfortable with. Well, I'm pro gonna propo propose that we take maybe one more question. I mean, the questions have been so wonderful and your answers so forthcoming, but maybe in light of the hour, one, one more if there is one. Let's go over to this side of the room. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, I I was thinking about what you were saying. That, uh, things that might get lost or new things that might emerge. Excuse me. Oh, I'll try it. Okay. I was thinking about what you said. That things might get lost or things might emerge with this new form of um, archiving the digital. And I also thought about um, that book. Um, All that is solid melts into air. You know that thing that for 500 years things have been getting lost. And yet, as, you're, as you said, there are certain performances that are still very much alive. You know? um, so I wonder if what uh, we see, or the anxiety, because I, I have that anxiety with the digital as well, might be related to a form of institutions or power that we're not used to deal with so directly. Because in the archive, we're used to certain the state or institutions be, uh, that are more recognizable. But in a way, dealing with, with uh, the web, it's, as you said, who's there, who's behind this? And I wonder if it's just feeling that the subjectivity that might emerge from that, it's related, complete or left bare to the market, no. well, to market be. forces and not forms or institutions that we can recognize. It may be. I mean, I don't know where all that anxiety comes from, but I know that this thing about we have to save, there's this uh, thread of loss just seems super prevalent to me. I mean, even in performance, I mean, if you think about the Marina Abramovich, the re-performances and all of this, it's like, now we have to say performance, you know, in the embodied practice way, right? Rather than as a document. And this thing about saving, preserving, keeping, it's, it seems to me just very, um, very um, prevalent. And the talk about the technology, not just digital, but about technology in general seems to echo that. And it seems to be kind of clustered around technology. I'm not sure that it is. I'm not sure how related that is to that, right? I mean, I don't think things will be more lost or found than they were before. But um, but it seems to accrue to technologies, this whole thing about saving and, and loss. And, and maybe how far the memory gets away from the body, right? 
I mean, now when we go up to uh, the web 3.0 and we're talking about these clusters and clouds and all of that, then that memory is really, really far away from the body. It's certainly not in my head and it's not even on my computer anymore, right? It's somewhere where I don't know where it is. So maybe it's a distance between me and my memory. I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much.